Hi, I'm Bruce Goldstein. I'm discussing technology transfer today. And for my final segment, I'm going to discuss the bottom line, how tech transfer makes an impact. So I can primarily talk about tech transfer at NIH, but as I go through, I'll also be including information about tech transfer at other institutions. For intramural inventions, those made in-house, we have about 400 new inventions per year, get about 100 new patents per year. Uh, we sign about 250 licenses per year, and it varies dramatically, but it's over $100 million in royalties collected per year. So most of that money goes back into doing research. Some of it is uh, given to the inventors as part of their compensation as a reward. You may recognize some of these products. Um, they derived in whole or in part from major discoveries made at the NIH. So I, I have a special place in my heart for the paclitaxel coated stents. Um, that was one of the first technologies I worked on when I came to the NIH. It was invented in uh, 1992. We started collaborative work and licensing in 1995-96. Uh, this came out of the National Institute on Aging and uh, it reached the market, I believe, in early 2002. So the process, as you know, takes a long time. It took that long for me to start seeing the results of what I had been working on. But you'll recognize some of the other products that are on the market, and these two came directly from NIH discoveries. But what we're really proudest of are the fact that they're not just important discoveries, but truly first in class. So the first HPV vaccine, uh, the first monoclonal for any infectious disease, uh, rotavirus, um, Minafrivac, that one actually came out of the FDA, not the NIH, but we were at the time handling it. Um, that was a situation where in particular, we were looking to create a vaccine that would be stable at um, sub-Saharan Africa temperatures and conditions, um, easy to use without uh, a serious infrastructure, and most importantly, it could be done for a dollar or less per dose. Um, that was a huge collaboration, and ultimately they did make it to market, so um, we're very proud of that one. Several of our products also came through Kratos. Um, these are some of the older ones, um, but you may recognize them as well. Not all of the products that reached the market were invented by the NIH. Um, we use these because these happen to be primarily ones uh, that came out of NIH technologies. Um, some of them are very successful, like Velcade. Some of them are not so successful, like Flumist. But it is important to note that in one stage or another, we used Kratos to move those uh, a, a major step forward towards marketing. Some growth, uh, this is economic impact of tech transfer, and this is now going much far farther than uh, NIH. This is tech transfer in the United States. We have about 5,000 US companies still active in 2017 that came out of tech transfer activities. We are currently generating about one and a half new companies on average per day, and nearly 300,000 jobs directly created from technology transfer. We account for something in the range of $200 billion as a fraction of the U.S. gross domestic product. And NIH, pat on the back, ours is over $6 billion in sales. In terms of return on investment, and this is using classic uh, economics, uh, the federal funding of research and development, that has generated about a 30% annualized return to the taxpayer. So you think about your bank account getting 1% annualized return, you realize that is a huge benefit to the economy, uh, benefiting the taxpayer from federal research dollars. More on NIH-funded research. Um, we, there's a perception that government productivity versus companies, that we're the laggards and can't do anything. Well, actually, when you look at the data, it is the exact opposite. 
Um, we're much more efficient. We have 32 issued patents per 100 million invested in, this is specifically the biomedical sector, where when you look at companies, it's two and a half patents per 100,000. And this is their research and development budgets, not their marketing budgets. High quality, when you look at forward citations, for us it's about eight, um, which is double for the private sector and specifically six times the rate for European uh, biomedical sector. High impact, for every dollar spent in intramural research alone, that has produced two uh, $2.21 in economic growth. So that's looking directly at the, the companies that are founded, their jobs are created. Uh, in 2013-2014, NIH worked with a number of private sector uh, companies to, I'm sorry, public sector company, uh, universities to gather raw data to say, all right, so how many new chemical entities and, and um, how many... Uh, uh, technologies did we bring forward? And it, once again, if you look at, AUTUMN stands for the Association of University Technology Managers. Um, they show once again that uh, NIH-funded universities really crushed companies in terms of productivity. So public sector research um, that is mostly su uh, supported by the NIH in terms of drug development in particular, has had a huge impact. And you can see it in that of all NDAs, 9% of them came from public sector research inventions. And when it comes to new chemical entity NDAs, 13% of those came from public sector research. About one in five of all priority review NDAs came from public sector research. This is uh, and something we're particularly proud of. And 90% of all NDAs for new indications started in some way, shape, or form with public sector research. Um, of the discoverers among public sector, the NIH is still the most prolific. So we're quite proud of that. So it's pretty darn clear, patent licenses, creatives, and the other tools of tech transfer really are crucial to moving ideas through from the, from the invention stage, from the, the, clin, uh, the uh, laboratory, through the clinic, and to the marketplace. I'm grateful for your attention. Um, if you have questions that are very specific to me, uh, here is my contact information. And hopefully the uh, webpage will remain up to date. Our office will be moving sometime, we expect, in 2020 but we expect that the phone numbers, email, and web page will remain the same. I hope you found this useful, interesting, and so forth. I thank you for your attention. And if you have any questions about this talk, please direct them to the program coordinator.